Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited because our guest is very renowned in the UFO community. His name is Preston Dennett. And of course, um, he's going to do an intro and tell you uh, who he is, about his life work, what he's doing right now. And then we're going to get running with the question. So thank you so much, Preston, for joining us. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, it's an honor. It's a delight. I'm pretty happy to be here and talk about these subjects. I think they're important. It's certainly not a subject I would ever thought I would be researching. <laughs> I really wasn't interested in UFOs at all. I was a skeptic. Uh, I was pretty young. I was 21 years old when I heard a report on the news about a sighting over Alaska. It's a very well-known case. J.A.L. Airlines, Captain Kendrew Tarochi and his crew were followed by this UFO. Well, two of them were several miles. It was on radar. It's a great case. Uh, but the news report was very short. It kind of just joked about it. I was not a believer in the subject. I did. I just thought the stars were too far away. I was very much a materialist, very scientifically minded, and thought I knew the truth about the subject. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Because I found out, much to my shock, that I knew quite a few people who were having encounters or had had encounters. Uh, I remember my older brother, Mark, years earlier, actually, when I was probably 13 or 14 years old, came running into the house, super excited, saying he'd seen a UFO. I'm like, Mark, go away. They're not real. You couldn't have seen a UFO. They don't exist. <laughs> You're wrong. And I didn't even listen. But after hearing this news report, I decided, you know, I will ask him. And he described a really incredible experience. He was with his two friends in brief, Phil and Greg, driving down Reseda Boulevard one evening. This is right outside of Los Angeles, a fairly populated area. And they saw your classic flying saucer, you know, little lights on the edge, totally silent, little dome on top. And it was very low, like treetop level. And they actually chased it down Reseda Boulevard in their car uh, for 15 minutes. So, yeah, he's describing all this, totally blowing my mind. I'm just looking at him like, are you, are you kidding me? He's like, listen, if you don't believe me, which I did believe him at this point. He says, if you don't believe me, go ahead and ask Phil and Greg. You know them. Those were his friends. And I did. And they, of course, confirmed his story. That's what sent the ball rolling. I found out that uh, his future wife, his girlfriend, had had some really amazing visitations by little blue beings. She told me that later. My other brother, his soon-to-be wife, had seen UFOs as well. She had witnesses with her. She later had an encounter with gray ETs. Uh, I had some friends who had very close encounters. One had missing time. Uh, had I brought it up at work. <laughs> you know, I worked at a business office with 20 or 30 people. And the lady whose desk was right next to mine, I'd worked with her for a long time, said, oh, yeah, UFO. My whole family saw one. You should talk to my daughter. She says a gray alien came into her room. She got pulled on board. I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> what is going on here? So that's when I started picking up books to sort of try to disprove it, even though at this point I knew it was real. I just couldn't accept it. So I bought every book I could find. I joined every UFO group. I became a field investigator for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, one year into this. Uh, started interviewing people formally. Started doing radio interviews, occasional TV interviews. That happened pretty quickly. And for about 10 years, just dove into research. Uh, I wrote about 30 articles. And then in 1996, I put out my first book, which was about healing cases. I've since re-released that. The, it's called The Healing Power of UFOs. First book had 100 cases. The next has 300. <laughs> so it's pretty common, actually. But yeah, that's how it started for me. And I've never looked back. I've written about a book per year since 1996. And at last count, it's 32 bucks. Wow. That's so impressive. So so it was a, like a process for you that you got involved in the 
UFO community. How, what was the research like for you? Did you, like when you worked for MUFON, they would send you on investigations? Like, what was that like? I, I know you said in an interview, they put you through a pretty rigorous process, right? To be able to, to do this. Like, tell us about MUFON and, and what you did with them and what was, you know, what that was like. Yeah, it was thrilling. A real good time in my life. Because the first year was real rough. I mean, I had to readjust my whole worldview. I was not a happy person. Uh, it was pretty upsetting. I felt scandalized, not only by my family, who I felt were keeping secrets from me, but, you know, our own government. And this darn UFO cover-up, the media, which was not portraying this subject seriously, was very fear-based. So it was a big adjustment. I was very glad to find MUFON because I'm like, oh, well, here are some people who are actually studying this seriously. And I actually, you know, I became a member. I'm like, you know what? They have a monthly newsletter, MUFON Journal. I'm like, I want all of them all the way back to when you started, which is like 1967 or something like that. Mm. So I mean, I'm going through, I took this subject very seriously. And when I found out that they offered field investigators, uh, I'm like, I'm on board with this. Now, today, it's a much more rigorous process where you have to take classes and go through quite a process. Back then, it was a bit different. The organization wasn't quite as large. And they didn't really give you classes. You just kind of dove into the deep end. But they did require you take a test. And they're like, it's a take-home test. I'm like, OK, well, it's a take-home test. This will be a breeze. This was back before, you know, the internet. Uh, and I got that test and I'm like, wow, this is not going to be easy. Uh, and it took quite a bit of studying and research. Now, the UFO section, there was a whole section on, you know, the history of UFOs. I aced that. That was a breeze. I knew my stuff by then. I had every book you could find, which, you know, back then weren't nearly as many as there are now. Mm -hmm. But there was a section on photography which I really had to, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I happened to be taking astronomy in college at the time. So there was a whole section on that, which I did really well. And meteorology, I also took that class in college. And I'm glad I did because it's a lot more scientific and complicated than you might think. Sure. I mean, there's 50 different kinds of clouds. Well, not 50, but just about. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, various sections like that. And I think it was about 200 questions. Did really, really well. I was so mad I missed two questions. One I didn't know, but one I accidentally wrote the wrong answer. And they would, you know, we had little monthly meetings, which back then were 10 or 20 people. As time went on, it went up, expanded to, you know, 100 or 200. And this is LA, you know, so a fairly large city. <laughs> Uh, but we were just meet in the back of a bank building, actually, a little room there that they were able to rent. And there were just a few of us. And they'd assign me a case and I'd be like, wow, this is cool. Especially if it involved entities or a landing or something, which was pretty rare. Most were anomalous lights or you know, a daylight disc would be awesome. But that didn't happen a whole lot. And I did that for a few years, eventually sort of became more independent. I still support MUFON. I've spoken for many of their little local groups and for MUFON Central a couple of times. They're global, right? Aren't they global? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're huge, right? Well, why do you think that our government doesn't, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but take them that seriously or take their research that seriously? Yeah. Well, it's beginning to change a little bit, which is interesting to see because MUFON is the biggest citizens wow. UFO study group. And we know our own governments have study groups that are behind the scenes, right. you know, other than Project Blue Book or the Conning Committee or the Robertson Panel or even ATIP and Arrow and all of those. This is a subject they take very seriously. Publicly, not so much. Uh, you know... This subject, I think, to a certain extent, we're all victims of this cover-up. It's been a very carefully orchestrated, yeah. well-funded campaign to discredit yeah. this subject and the witnesses. So I think they are taking it seriously, but just not 
letting anybody know. Yeah. There has not been disclosure in terms of government. Uh, well, still... we had hope there for a moment, <laughs> yeah. right? And then they came, what was it, the ATIB report where they just denied everything and said, there's no such thing as UFOs. It's so confusing and so frustrating. It is, because on one hand, they're saying, well, there is validity to this phenomenon. But wait, maybe it's Russia or China. Yeah. <laughs> or and, and we identified one as a balloon and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's ridiculous. One step forward, two steps back, three steps sideways. Then they're running in a circle. Yeah. It's like, this is nonsensical. But absolutely, it's getting attention. And that's thrilling to yeah. see, because we've had no movement within government circles whatsoever for decades. And now it is being talked about by senators and representatives and governors. Yeah, that's true. It, I, I thought it kind of weird, too, that like when we were in the midst of COVID, they released a lot of UFO information. People at that point, I don't think they were that they were feared for their lives. So I don't I think it kind of took a back seat, you know, in terms of. Like popularity, people were like, I'm not that interested, but. There's, there's always a running interest in it, but I think people just feel so lied to that they get disgusted. They just, they don't know what to believe anymore. And that's why I think it's so important to speak to people like yourself. Are you a scientist by nature or where are you in this, in in like your professional career? Where did you start and, and what, what are you doing now? Yeah, I was always very, very interested in science. I loved science fiction. Uh, so I was really science-based, took a lot of science in college. Uh, as far as a career, I worked doing initially data entry and moved up into bookkeeping and became a full-charge bookkeeper and basically accounting, uh, which is very analytical. And yeah. that was, you know, that's how I made my money. Even though I did start writing books right away, there's not really any money in books. <laughs> Certainly not UFO books. Yeah, every dog <laughs> says that. Every, every, my dog, sorry, he's Barker. <laughs> um, they, they do, you, I've heard that so many times before. So I, I, I really, some people, I mean, I know Whitley Strieber, he was able yeah. to make quite a bit of money, but he was already a professional writer. Right, right. Uh, but it's still a niche subject, you know. Is it? For it to be for a UFO book to reach the say New York Times bestseller list, I think there's been three or four of them. Oh, is that That's, right? Yeah, yeah. The day after Roswell did, Communion did. Oh, Communion, yeah. Um, I think that were, made it to the movies too. So, yeah. Yeah, a few have done it, but by and large, no. Uh, books, cookbooks, and self-help books, and romance novels. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Those are the ones, you know. Yeah. Thrillers. Uh, they they hit the bestseller list. But it's That's changing. Perfect. You know, there are now so many books being published, books on just like UFO propulsion or you know, very specialized books. So we've definitely built a huge database worldwide mm -hmm. of documented encounters, which I think at this point, if you were to count it, exceeds probably a million cases. I know MUFON and New Fork together have about 250,000 documented, documented cases. Wow. You know, so that's no small change. That's no, 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 no. <laughs> now you you personally had some encounters yourself, right? That's right. Yeah. Let's talk thrilling. about them. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it was so thrilling to you know read these books. You know, Travis Walton's books and Betty and Barney Hill, and you know the case of Calvin Parker and Charlie Hickson and Betty Andreessen. I'm like, wow, you know, this is happening. Uh, and then I would start interviewing people. I'm like, wow, this is even better than the books. I'm talking to people firsthand, but I haven't seen one. While I believe that this is a real subject, I don't have the firsthand knowledge because there's a big gap between belief and knowing. I wanted to know, even though I kind of did know, <laughs> I wanted experience. I wanted to see it myself. And I was circling closer and closer to actually having an encounter because... I started to make friends with a lot of people who were contactees. And I started interviewing them and knowing them quite well. And it was only a matter of time I realized before I had my first sighting. And I did. I see. I saw unexplained lights. But here's the weird thing, you know. Finding out UFOs were real made me much more 
weirdly skeptical, much more discerning, uh, because having been lied to and you know had secrets kept from me, I was much more skeptical in a in a weird way. So I'd see these lights, I'd be like, okay, well, that's not a satellite. That's not a shooting star. You know, it's not a plane balloon, helicopter, and so forth. But it's still just a light. So I, and often it would be very brief, high up there, and slightly ambiguous. So I've, I'd seen a few of those. Mind you, I was going to people's homes when they said, you know, I had an encounter last night. Like, can I come over and interview you face to face? Off, I learned encounters would sometimes happen two or three days in a row. So I'd be there <laughs> hoping to have, you know, a sighting. Uh, and really what happened, my first really good unexplained event occurred during this massive UFO wave over Topanga Canyon. This is where I grew up. This is right off the coast of Southern California, right outside of LA. Oh, there's my dog. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> she. Hey. <laughs> She's adorable. Um, Great Dane. She's so big. Oh, they're great dogs. <laughs> so, yeah, there was this huge wave which hit Topanga Canyon between Santa Monica and Malibu, right on the California coast, just west of L.A. And this is where I grew up. I had never seen anything. Uh, but on, it started on June 14th, 1992. A bunch of people called the police. A bunch of people called the local paper saying that, UFOs were hovering over their house or chasing them down the road or sending down beams of light or landing next to their house, this sort of thing. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. So the newspaper editor, Colin Penno, calls me up because I had written an article for the local paper a couple of years earlier. And he's like, here's some names. Here's some phone numbers. These are people who called us doing an investigation. People are calling the police. I called the police. They verified it. They took my number. I told them, you know, I'm a MUFON field investigator refer me anybody who calls because they don't really handle calls. So I started getting cases from both the editor of the newspaper and the police station. I went all in. I mean, I put up flyers throughout this town of about 8,000 residents and uh, was cold calling people out of the phone book because mm -hmm. you know, I could identify them. Like, well, here's a resident. I knew a lot of people there too. And so I was building this whole investigation up and interviewing a lot of people. And it was one month into this, it was July 5th, I will never forget it, uh, that I had my first real good sighting. I had just left my brother and sister's house. My brother, Mark, the one who had the sighting, and his, his wife, Christy, she does the illustrations for all my books. She's worked very closely with me as an artist. And it was about... 11.30 p.m., close to midnight on a Sunday evening. And it started to get late. So I'm like, you know, I've got to go home. I've got to work tomorrow. I, you know, I'm working full time. So I left their house in Woodland Hills. They lived on a little street called Gallandrina, very skinny little side street. And I'm coming around this hairpin corner, which is quite steep and very tight. So you can't go fast, maybe three to five miles an hour. When I saw what I thought at first was a bird swooping down towards my car, instantly discarded that because it was glowing and it was round. <laughs> and it's swooping down towards my car and it's quite small. I'm like, oh gosh, is that a firecracker? Because, you know, July 5th. And no, it wasn't. It came right down in front of my windshield over the hood of my car which point I'm thinking, well, that's not a reflection. <laughs> what is this? Because it was a ball of light, an orb about the size of a tennis ball, slightly smaller, white, slightly yellow, hard edges, wavering slightly, but right in front of my face and maybe two feet away, very close. And I'm looking at it, you know, holding the, my steering wheel like, oh my gosh. And this darn thing, if I remember correctly, moved first to the left, then all the way to the right, all the way back to the left again, spanning my whole windshield back right in front of my face. And that point, I knew this was something really unusual and intelligently controlled. Of course, not a spacecraft or anything. It was, I don't know, a probe? I can only speculate. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's what I honestly think, because... Mm -hmm. 
of what happened next. <laughs> this darn thing scoots forward, dips down, goes straight up. And I'm gripping my steering wheel, watching it go up through the canopy of the trees, straight up and gone. And whoosh, the entire experience left my mind. I don't remember what happened next. Because you know, I've seen UFOs since then, a dozen times probably. Uh, and uh, I always think, oh, I write it down and I call someone up. I'm like, you're not going to believe it, this amazing <laughs> encounter. I didn't do that. I would have and should have turned around and said, Mark, Christy, guess what happened? Didn't do that. I don't remember waking up the next morning thinking, oh, I saw something. It wasn't until months later that it just popped into my head without any cue, no trigger. I just plain spontaneously remembered that experience. And it took me a while to realize, you know, that's probably missing time. <laughs> don't uh, remember driving home. It sounds like your memory was wiped or... I don't remember it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I did start having dreams of being on board, craft, seeing ETs. Wow. And that year was huge because I had another sighting a month later with Mark and Christy up at Crater Lake where this light was blinking in the sky and we had our flashlight, a super powerful one. We blinked it and it blinked back at us. And I thought, well, could that be a coincidence? We blinked twice, it blinked twice. Not a coincidence. That's impossible for it to be anything other than something communicating with us. And then I joined, you know, came back to LA and Stephen Greer, who I'm sure you've heard of, oh, yeah. came into town and formed CSETI, uh, the LA group, where we would basically go out late at night to try to make contact. And we did. First night out, we saw an anomalous light. Second night out, same thing. So we formed a core group of about 10 of us, and we had a, some really good sightings. So that's, you know, that turned out to be a huge year for me, <laughs> 1992. Oh. And as the years went on, I started to have more and more sightings. Did you record any of these on video? Uh, no, we didn't. It was difficult to do because often it would be would happen, and then it would be, you honestly did not have a chance. Yeah. There's a, one time, I don't know why we didn't do it, uh, because it was blinking back and forth at us. We all had cameras, uh, but nobody even thought of doing it. It's funny yeah, when you see these things. <laughs> I, I, I hear this from contactees and experiencers all the time. Like, well, I had a camera with me, but for some reason, you know, I didn't use it. I've had that experience. You're, you, this is happening and you're riveted. You're just looking at it and you're like, oh my God, you don't want to take your eyes off of it. Do you think it's it's the uh, entities doing that on purpose to people, making them not record like through telepathic? I mean, it sounds, since it's so prevalent. Cases, yeah, in some yeah. cases, I think uh, that's definitely a possibility. I can't prove it. In other cases, I think, well, I mean, we know the camera will just malfunction. Yeah, that happens too. Batteries yeah, die and get drained. And if it's that yeah, close it's and it's got a, a field around it, it yeah. drains the camera. There was one case I investigated on Catalina Island, group of 11 or 12 witnesses, and four were photographers. And everybody had a camera. <laughs> they all had cameras. Not one of them worked. Right. All their watches stopped, none of their flashlights would work. Was yeah. a really good. Yeah, example. that's a common theme that seems to run through those types of um, experiences. What about um, lately? Have what? What's the last sighting that you could tell us about that you've had? Whether it was lights oh, or, or. Yeah, I mean, it really ramped up for me because I started having more encounters. Saw a metallic ship once. Uh, had a craft come over. Well, I'll call it a crap. It was really just a glowing light. And it kind of gave me a telepathic message because I was interviewing this lady who had major encounters. And I was kind of transcribing her interview. And I'm wondering, gosh, is this lady for real? When I got a very strong impulse, this is 1994, to go onto the roof of my condo. And when I grabbed my eyeglasses, which I use for driving, which is kind of weird, because why would I do that? Mm. It was a very strong impulse. And... This UFO appeared and gave me a message like, she's real. You can believe her. We're her ETs. Watch this. And it darted around. And so I would get 
little messages every now and then. And again, having more and more dreams of being on board, which were not normal dreams at all. So obviously they know about you and they've known about you for quite a while. Yeah, I got really good evidence of that when witnesses started telling me that they were referred to me by the ETs. First time that happened, I'm like, yeah, sure. Wow. Then, you know, I interviewed this lady, Dolly Saffron. I ended up writing a whole book about her case called Symmetry. And she told me at one point that she was looking for someone to tell her story and couldn't find anyone. And that's when her ET contacts said, you know, here's this guy and gave her my name. So, yeah. And I eventually had a this is my most recent, a full-on onboard experience. Fully conscious. Turned out to be you with did? I did. And it was the most oh, amazing experience ever. I mean, tell I us about it. that. Tell us about that. Yeah, it turned out to be with her ETs, basically, Dolly Saffron. And uh, it was on my birthday. This is September of 2021, I believe. Uh so not that long ago. No, yeah, May on my birthday, May 6th, 2021 and 22, you know, thereabouts. I wrote it down. Uh, but it was so cool because I'm, you know, I'm in bed, I'm dreaming, I'm asleep, right? And suddenly, you know, I'm having a dream. And suddenly I'm blasted awake because I'm being pulled up into this beam of light. Kind of an energy beam is how... And it's weird because I recognize the feeling. I'm like, oh, this has happened before. I know exactly what's happening here. Um, I'm being pulled on board a craft. And it, it quickly became all dark around me, the darkness of space. I'm like, this is great. you pulled out through a window or through through walls? Like, what, what was that yeah, like? I did not remember that part. You know, I was asleep. I was dreaming. Next thing I know, I'm flying through outer space is what it felt like. Wow. And it's very energetic, very high energy. And, but I'm like, well, you know, this, I, I'm, I was used to it weirdly. I'm like, this is fine. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm being taken. I can't believe it. This is happening. I was thrilled and I got pulled on board. I found myself on this little table. And this is so cool because you know, how many people have I talked to who had this experience? Mm -hmm. A lot, hundreds. And so it's so, you get sort of this idea in your head about what it's like. And it was a little different, but I did see the rooms that people describe, which are rounded and very well lit internally. And I'm lying on this table and there are little guys around me who I didn't really pay much attention to because I, my attention was captured by this one woman who was hovering over me looking down. And she was beautiful. She was what we would call a hybrid. But she wasn't fully human. She had, I mean, she was a very nice looking person. You know, I didn't, she looked different, but it didn't bother me at all. Her eyes were quite large and quite wrapped around, very small features, very pale skin. She did have blonde, tightly curled hair, wearing a white jumpsuit, very slender. And she kept asking me over and over again, are you okay? You know, are you fine? How do you feel? I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I feel good. <laughs> And I kept trying to get up and they're like, no, just wait a second. We need to Is make sure. Verbal you're okay. or telepathic communication. Oh gosh. Um I'm gonna say telepathic, but it felt verbal. You know, it's I can't tell you for sure, honestly, but I feel like it was probably telepathic. Uh, because I, it feels that way, you know. Uh and they kept saying, you know, over and over again, are you sure you're fine? And I'm like, yes, yes, please let me get up. Because <laughs> I'm looking around and I, I see stuff that I want to look at. Uh, which is, you know, there are people in there. <laughs> there are other ETs. There are windows around the whole circumference of this 40, 50 foot room. And finally, they're like, okay, I guess you're fine. And I jumped up. I'm like, I, I am fine. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you. Because I had done this before. I remember. And... Very light, gra well, lightish gravity, pretty much the same, but a little bit lighter. And it's very comfortable. And I instantly walked over to this very, very tall gray, who I now know who it is. It's the main contact of my friend Dolly Saffron, who she calls Mama. She's this very tall, exquisitely graceful 
knowledgeable Paul Gray. A huge head, very large eyes. She wears a smock. And she, I walked right up to her, and she's seven feet tall, if not a little taller. So, you know, I'm five, nine and three quarters, and I'm looking up to her like that. I'm picturing she, the close encounters, Grays, that come out of the ship. They were very tall in that movie. Yeah, somewhat like that, but yeah, different. You know, mm. uh, I, I have drawn her, um, not as well as my sister in law did, who's an artist. Uh, and Dolly, of course, drew her as well. And I reckon I knew who this was to, on some level because she tilts her head and she looks at me and she smiles, tiny little mop. And she says, So, is this what you thought it would be? And I said, No, no, it's so much better. This is much better than I thought. Can I go exploring? She said, of course, go, go right ahead. And I, I saw like two rows of people, young, young people in their 20s, standing in somewhat of a daze, looking a little bit hypnotized. Yeah. In the center of the craft, right near this table, where there's a lot of light. And I walked by them because I wanted to see the other side and what was outside the windows. And I looked down, and we were in outer space, all right. And there's the Earth. Not like a tiny little ball, but quite large. Well, let's still... get this straight. The Earth is round. It's not flat, right? 100%. Yep, I saw it. <laughs> you get a lot of, you know, <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah. You know, I've, it's round, and I can confirm that with my own eyes. So we have a globe, <laughs> right? That's great. <laughs> and it was Go so ahead. cool. I mean, you look down at this, and it's breathtaking. And, uh, you know, the windows were slightly angled. And I'm looking down, I'm like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. I turn around and I walk up to these people who are standing in the center of the craft and start talking to them. And they're, they're out of it. They're not fully clicking to, they're not fully conscious. We're, these are humans. These are human beings, yep. Who were also teleported. I'm assuming, the yeah, I did not get a chance to ask. But, you know, there was... Do you think they were, like, hypnotized or... Under some type of sedation or something like maybe they were freaking out and they had to like sedate them or I don't know. What do you think? They didn't look afraid, but they yeah. said, they, you know, because I went up there. I'm like, hi, my name's Preston. What's your name <laughs> to this lady? And she didn't answer me. And I looked at another guy. You know, he's a black guy and, and he's out of it. And, you know, they're all different ethnicities. Oh. I'm like, well, these people aren't clicking to it. You know, I'm not going to get an any information from them yeah. I looked over at the other far side and there were some shorter full um grays who looked real different and you know, my heart went oh look at that <laughs> because you know that was that did didn't scare me but i'm like wow look at that they are different and then i saw this lady who looked korean to me she looked like this girl i work with at my office uh, I'm like, gosh, she's she's fully awake and she's having a good time. And I walked over to her. She was standing by the window looking out. And I was about to say something to her when the craft dropped down. Um, we must have been, I don't know, let's see, 20 miles up. That's uh, up? It's up there. You know, it's a plane flies at 30,000 feet. What is that? Right. Five miles, six miles? Yeah. Up it was way, way higher than that, for sure. Okay. So, and you could absolutely see the curve of the Earth. But the Earth pretty much filled up most of the mm -hmm. view. Half, I would say. But we dropped down in an instant. It took maybe a second. Maybe two, but I doubt it. Because it snap, we were there. The lady next to me, she goes, woo! She was so excited. And I'm like holding on. There was this little rail that I could hold on to. And I'm looking down, and I watched that Earth come up so fast. And we stopped about five or six feet above the ground, and the ship rocked like this. It was so cool. I'm like, wow, I can actually feel that. You didn't feel the acceleration or deceleration or any of it. But when it stopped, it rocked a little bit. I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And then we went right back up pretty darn quick. It was a brief experience overall, about five minutes. Oh. I walked back to the center, and there was... Mama, the tall, tall gray, holding a glass tumbler or, you know, clear, translucent, what looked like glass to me. 
a very small glass, very thick, and it had a green liquid inside about hmm, a third of the way filled, a couple of ounces. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, it's a little syrupy. And she's like, go ahead and drink that. I'm like, oh, okay. And I sniffed it and I couldn't really smell it. And I tasted it. And I'm like, oh, this is not bad. It tastes like kiwi lime. Very, very subtle. A little tiny bit sweet, but almost tasteless. And uh, they started to take it away from me. I'm like, wait, <laughs> you know, I really wanted to taste that. And they gave me this look of astonishment, like, really? You want another sip of this? <gasps> okay. And I'm like, yeah, I really want, an I want another sip. So they gave me another sip because I wanted to memorize the taste of it. And that was it. I blacked out. Uh, and I woke up in bed instantly. There was just a quick shift from, you know, to unconsciousness and immediately conscious. I'm like, wow, this happened. I actually happened. Jumped up. I wrote it down. Uh, and yeah, that was my onboard experience. I how loved do you know it. That, how do you, that's, that's incredible. How do you know that wasn't a dream state that, because we, I mean, I've had some dreams in my life that when I woke up, I, I, I was astonished that they weren't real. They seemed yeah. so real. Well, here's how I would put it. You know, I've studied dreams inside and out most of my life because very early on, at the same time I started doing UFO research, I started having dreams that my recently deceased mother was coming into my room and visiting me. And I knew on some level it was her, but I didn't believe in life after death. You know, I didn't believe in ghosts or UFOs or anything. She died in 1984 and about 1985, these dreams are happening. And in 1986, you know, I'm discovering UFOs are real. I picked up Robert Monroe's book, about out-of-body experiences. And I pursued that vigorously and learned how to do it and had out-of-body experiences and dreams that come like astral, true. Like astral projection? Yep, absolutely. I got pretty darn good at it, still am. And up to my dream recall to the point where I remember three, four, five, six dreams a night uh, and still do. So I'm very familiar with dreams. I interviewed everyone I know about their own dreams because I'm trying to figure what dreams were uh, and had to throw away all my dream books at one point because they were garbage. No way. The theories on dreams are not correct for the most part. Well, not to deviate too much from the ufology thing, but in your estimation, what, what are dreams? Where do they come from? What do they mean? Um, they're real experiences and there are certain degrees of awareness that come along with them with the lowest level being simple replays of what you experienced in a way to process you know, the day's experience. Um, beyond that, it would be there you're working through a psychological level where most of, and this is where most people are at, their dreams reflect fears and desires for the most part. And then you go beyond that and you start having precognitive dreams, hmm. which are, are lucid dreams where you're awake within the dream. And I've had many, many of those. So you're able to discern your lucid dream from an actual, uh, ab I don't want to call an abduction. Well, you were abducted, mm -hmm. but so I guess we could call it that. But you I know the difference. <laughs> you I would call, call it an onboard experience because abducted has got negative terms it to it. It does. It does. But, but technically you weren't kind of abducted but it was a pleasant abduction I mean, <laughs> right? it wasn't taken That's, i mean if you want to i like that okay <laughs> so you you can discern a lucid dream from from a taken event i mean oh you yeah know definitively what yeah 100 percent. because in a lucid dream while you are in effect awake you can discern the environment around you as being a psychological projection whereas an out-of-body experience you can discern that this is a real environment around you, uh, but it's different because you're flying around and you're walking through walls and you can have all these abilities. Whereas, you know, this onboard experience was different. I was awake. I was physically you were awake. awake. You know, you were awake. Oh, yeah. You know that feeling, you know, like right now when you're awake, you know, you're not dreaming. Yeah, you, you know, know you're no, awake. No. Right. You know. Uh, so, I mean, that's how I would put it. Uh, I mean, it was really to the point where I considered, my like, could this have been an out-of-body experience? Mm -hmm. 
uh, because in some ways it did feel very energetic. But no, I mean, I drank, drank liquid. I was walking around. I was talking to people. It was very coherent. It was a narrative that, you know, followed the a, a normal timeline of experience. Was that your most vivid um, experience as far as being taken? Or do, do you have others that are just as vivid to you or that you know were real? Like, do you have memory of them, of your other? I do, but they... Uh, we're, we're recalled through the dream state. Mm. Uh, so I would like, I really worked hard at it too, to remember, right? And being very familiar with dreams, how quickly they change from one scene to another and how right. they transmogrify and reflect your own fears and desires. And I mean, there's, there, I had these quote dream memories, which were very coherent and very reflective of an actual experience. And if you've ever dreamt of an experience you've had that's real, you kind of know what I mean, uh, where uh, you dreamt, you know, it's hard to describe because uh, it's a very subjective experience. Right. Each of Why us have our own experiences. At least for me personally, I tend to remember most impactfully the dreams that I have closer to my waking time in the morning than I do like say in the, I mean, I know we have rapid eye movement, all different periods of sleep, right? Is that when our dreams occur during rapid eye movement? Is that true? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I mean, there's, we go through a whole sort of stage of sleeping where you're basically unconscious for a little, it depends on what level of spiritual right. advancement you're at. Cause I've had, I've gotten to the point sometimes, this is certainly not every time, where you lie down and your body goes to sleep, but you remain fully aware. Right. And you rise up out of your body and you can spend the whole night doing whatever it is you want to do. And you come back and you're fully energized. You're fully rested. You didn't dream at all. You moved beyond the need to dream. So you were just spirit traveling, really, right? Yeah. But I heard most... that's not really safe to do. Is that true or is that? No, okay. that's not true. And believe me, I got every darn book on the subject. And here's how I know it's not true. <laughs> Beyond just my own experiences of decades of doing this mm -hmm. and reading about it. The fact is we're all spirit traveling every night. All of us. And I've gone out and I've seen people within my own. I have five brothers and sisters. I've met them out of body and they don't. You know, they're not doing it fully consciously, but we're all conscious mm -hmm. on the other side when we're, you know, supposedly, quote, asleep. And in fact, no, it's not dangerous. It's as safe as sleeping. It really is. And in fact, what I found is the opposite. I've got 20 some cases where people have been healed of physical illness, major diseases or minor colds, flus, cuts, bruises, or, you know, sarcoidosis, Bruce Moan had a really serious liver disease. He cured himself of it. Robert Monroe talked about this. Marilyn, during, during astral projection? Yeah, Terrell Wilson. Uh, one guy cured himself based, or stopped the progress of muscular dystrophy. Uh, so this is a very healing experience. Hmm. There are healing temples on the other side you can go and visit or places of learning or you can learn about past lives or go visit enlightened masters. It's 100% safe. It's not... I mean, not to say that there are, you won't run into difficulties here and there because you can be confronted by very hostile entities, earthbound souls, or and there are lower kind of what we would call hellish realms, which are not fun to be around or, and difficult to navigate. You encountered any of that during your travels, your spirit travels? You have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, but much later on, you know, when I was really good at it is when I started exploring those lower realms. But very early on, I had a few encounters with what I would call negative ent entities or things that you know, I'm not even quite sure what they were. <laughs> I mean, one time I was trying to get to the other side, which I have my method of doing. You know, you pop out of body, you're, you have an intention. Like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. This is who I want to see. And all the fun is on what we would call the other side, the quote, heavenly realms. And so I would fly straight up real fast and pop out through the veil between the dimensions and boom, you're in what we call the heavenly realms. 
And I'm doing that one time and some darn thing <laughs> grabs my leg, oh. probably my ankle. And I could feel two fingers on one side and two on the other. I'm like, this is not even human, whoever, whatever this is. And you were in a heavenly realm when this happened? I was trying to get there. I was, oh, okay. I was still in, you know, I guess, you know, I, I, I it's hard for me to find the terms. The ether, well, maybe somewhere in between. Yeah, um, the astral, the lower astral realm. Lower astral, okay. Which is, you know, here on Earth, you mm -hmm. pop out, and I guess it would be the fourth dimension. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, my progress was immediately slowed down, and I'm like, gosh, I'm something's got me by the ankle. <laughs> so I reached down and I peeled its little sticky fingers off. And I'm like, this is some sort of, I don't know what it is. I'd certainly read about this from other, I think Robert Monroe had something very similar happen, but I had no fear. I know this is safe as sleeping. Uh, and so I just peeled its little fingers off and I went on my merry way. No way. It but sounds almost lizard-like, like like a lizard kind of. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I didn't look hey. at it. But I have been accosted by earthbound souls who have no good intentions in mind. That's right. So yeah. what 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 is their intention? Um, uh, well, once I popped out of my body and I'm just exploring the house, which yeah. is fun to do. And I'm like, well, this is cool. Let's see what's going on outside. And I went out my front door. And this is this is in Reseda, which is a fairly densely populated area. Well, very densely populated. Who am I kidding? There was houses on all four sides of me. And there's these three guys walking down the street. And once you get good at this, you can kind of tell, you know, you can read people. Yeah. Especially when you're out of body because all of the barriers are sort of lifted. And you can communicate telepathically. In fact, you usually do. But these guys, I could tell instantly that they were earthbound. They were young. They were murderers, thugs. These were oh. bad folks. Yeah. And they were in a group, three of them. And they saw me and they made a beeline for me. Uh -huh. And they came rushing right up to me. I'm like, nope, I'm not doing this. Because I've read books where like, oh, you just get, send white light and love and this sort of thing. And I'm like, no, nope, because this was my first time <laughs> encountering this kind of thing. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. I rushed back inside and into my body. And I'm, I'm not dealing with these guys. Oh, I don't blame you. But later on, I wonder on, what their objective was. I don't know. There's not a whole lot you can do <laughs> to a person yeah. um, other than harass them or try to frighten them. Right, right. But I've since, you know, dealt with <laughs> people and, you know, I'm able to push them away by. That's exerting, good. Do you still like, do this? Is this a nightly thing for you or how often do you spirit travel? Uh, well, like I said, we all do it every night. So I get some glimmerings of it. But no, it's not a nightly thing for me. And it, it comes in waves. There'll be periods of time where I'm doing it nightly or close to it. It's more generally once or twice a week or even a month. Where um, you you set an intention. So So we all do this every night, right? Unconsciously. But you can set an intention to do this with maybe some specific place in mind in the heavenly realms yeah. or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's if I go to bed and really want to do it, I can do it. You know, I'm, I'm not quite the snap your fingers at will um, right. at that stage, but close. Yeah. You know, wow. I read all the books on it. I'm like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And so I've done yeah. all of these things that these experts, uh, to, you know, write about. Anyone can do it. It's not hard. I've, I've even got a little guide I put together. I've taught people how to do it successfully. Is that on your website? Uh, the guide isn't. The guide. I think I'll put that on my website. That's a good idea. Yeah, uh, I would. Yeah. Be. I, I hand it out to anyone who wants it. So That would be can... a great like free download. Yeah, I'll, I will do that. Yeah, that would be a great free download. Like sign up to my newsletter and get this download i mean i'm just thinking out the box but yeah i mean i would i send it to anybody who wants it you know if anyone's listening to this yeah email me preston ufo right, at right. com. super easy to remember i will email it to you you can contact yeah. me through my website too yeah that i think that's the way i i reached out to you through your website yeah. i uh, love the astral travel it is so much fun oh good lord maybe someday we could have a whole conversation just about that alone 
because I, I have like so many questions I would love to ask you about that. But um, after I read your book, the healing um, UFO book, what, what was it called? The Healing Power of UFOs. So you rewrote that, right? And now it has, as you mentioned, 300 true accounts of folks that were healed, right, by extraterrestrials. So you originally had 100 and then you rewrote it and you added 200 more. Am I right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I read that. It was pretty mind blowing. Um, Amazing, this, right? <laughs> oh, who knew? I <laughs> highly recommend that to people. I wish I would meet one of them and they could light a beam on me and heal some stuff going on. But <laughs> you never know. Yeah, I mean, which brings me to another. I want to get back to your book, but before I forget to ask you this, um, I I've spoken to some people that. Um, and, and you've alluded to the fact that you've done this with MUFON, right? Where you like set an intention with a group of people or by yourself to contact extraterrestrials, right? So like, is that largely successful in your experience? Whether somebody does it by themselves or with a group of people, do they know like when you have, when you set that intention, do these UAPs know that you're trying to communicate with them? Like, how does that work? Yeah, well, the ETs, and I do think that's what we're dealing with, ETs in the classic sense, mm -hmm. absolutely do know. We're all known by them. They're very telepathic. They're very highly evolved. And if you reach out to them, yeah, they can and often will respond. Does it happen every single time? No. Right. Uh, but it's absolutely doable. Um, I mean, we went out the first night with Stephen Greer and his you know, group. There was 30 or 40 of us. And a UFO showed up the first time we tried and the second night. Uh, now, we went out for five years, our little group, once every month or two. And we'd stay up all night until, like, we'd get there around, you know, 11 to some site, you know, preferably rural, uh, and stay up till 3, 4 a.m., and more often than not, we were not successful. But every now and then, we were. So it does work. It's all about telepathically, really. It's the consciousness that's the most important. Because, you know, you bring your flashlights. and But ultimately, I think telepathy and consciousness and awareness and meditation is the real key, yeah. the real tool. Right. That works best. And it's absolutely doable. And this is a big part of the whole UFO subject in more recent years. Mm -hmm. They call it close encounter of the fifth kind. Right. Uh, or human initiated. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of cases. A lot of people have been doing this long before Stephen Greer. There's been people doing this. Uh, I knew about it. Uh, so mm -hmm. absolutely. So when, when was your last, um, I guess, visual spotting of of uh, a uap or a ufo whatever you want to call it like wh when was your last one that you could remember where you looked up and said wow that's definitely a ufo like when how long ago was that that would probably be 2021 oh so it's been a minute uh, yeah yeah and i just walked out in my backyard with a feeling that they were out there and, and they called were. out to them and looked at a certain spot in the sky and something appeared and it was just a white light. So it yeah. wasn't like a, a craft craft, but it was cool because it appeared right. Yeah. And it wasn't a satellite. Cause this was, I don't know, 10 times the size of a star, oh, wow. the brightest star in the sky, like a quarter moon almost. And how long did that last for? Just like briefly three seconds or so. Yeah. But it was nice because oh, you know, yeah. I had the impulse you know, I knew they were out there and they were because um, every now and then they will communicate with you. Oh, I keep waiting. Every time I go out, I, I try. I mean, you know, I don't know. I would love to see one. I have not had the luxury of that yet, but I, I would absolutely love to see yeah, one. Well, they're, All of us are known by them, especially people who are involved in the subject or this field or working hard to help humanity in some capacity. Talk to a lot of contactees and the, those who are fully conscious and move past the fear and the, you know, using hypnosis right. and the missing time. Pretty much all of them have told me the, the what I just told you that we are all known by them and that on some level, all of us have been, had some level of contact. 
So let's talk about your book, The Healing um, UFO Book. Absolutely amazing. You went out and interviewed all these folks, right? Yourself. Or, um, not all 300 of them, but, but I, a, I lot, tracked, a large amount. Yeah, I tracked a good number of cases where I could. Yeah, some of them you just people. reiterated the stories, right, of healing yeah. like from other authors and stuff. Yeah. I can tell you for sure that most major researchers, especially those who have focused on direct contact cases, have cases of this kind, all of them. <laughs> Bud Hopkins, I cornered him once. I'm like, you've never written about this. Do you not have any healing cases? He's like, oh yeah, I absolutely do. And of course, David Jacobs has cases of people healed of diphtheria and pneumonia and cancer. And John- It's Mack. not widely talked about in the community. Mm. Well, why is that, do you think? I mean, that should be a hotbed topic, I would, I would think. I would think so. I was kind of puzzled by the lack of coverage and serious attention to it. I think there's a couple of reasons for it. This is a subject that already has a lot of pushback and skepticism and confusion and fear surrounding it. And people who have you know, friendly encounters get even a bigger dose of the skepticism and disbelief. So a lot of these people who are having these experiences keep quiet about it. Uh, and a lot of the researchers are hesitant to cover it because they're still trying to just prove this to people. <laughs> if you start talking about cures of cancer, they're like, people are going to be ultimately like, what are you talking about? Right. ET's come here to heal us. That makes it. You know, what? So I think it's ultimately our own fault, you know? And like I said, we're all victims of the cover up. Uh, so, but the fact is, I mean, these cases are real. Yes. They're all getting, all the researchers are getting these kinds of cases. John Mack, Yvonne Smith, Barbara Lamb, Edith Fiore, Ray Hernandez, uh, Bill, John Hesseman, is that his name? Um, Philip Mantle, Timothy Good, you name it. They've all got cases like this. Mm. Uh, and they're just not getting the attention they deserve because of all the fear yeah. and skepticism surrounding this subject. Our media is still fear-based. There's a fear narrative being pushed forth, and it's not okay. It's not true. Mm. I'm pretty upset about it uh, because it's not true. Uh, the what, about the implants? What, what about implants? Like, I've seen so many stories of folks that, you know, and even a doctor, what's that doctor's name who's specialized? Dr. Lear, yeah. Yeah. Your brother had an implant in his arm, did he not? Yeah, he sure what did. What happened with that? It just disappeared one day. Jeez. Uh, you know, I think he probably had a close encounter. You know, that sighting he had, he was within 100 feet of that craft. And I've come to learn that if you're that close to it, it's probably deeper levels of contact and very possibly an onboard experience. I can't prove it. He has no memory of that. Neither did the other guys. Yeah. But it wasn't long after that that he noticed. Well, actually, it was his wife who noticed it. She's like, what's that in your arm? Because so you could help it. it. Oh, you could. Yeah. It, well, you couldn't really see it, but you could touch it. And it was like about a half match stick. And it was right under the surface. And I'm like, Mark, you're coming with me to a doctor. He's a UFO MUFON field investigator. Come with me to the UFO meeting. He's going to be there. I told him about you. And the doctor was like, oh, my God. Yes, that's a foreign body. Let's get this x-ray. I'll take you to my office. I'll do it for free. My brother's like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And it disappeared one day. It's just gone. But I talked What was your brother's hesitation? Did he say, like, why he didn't want to investigate it further? Um, He's shy. He's a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. Yeah. Um, It took... You know, some convincing to let me interview him. And he's like, yeah, you can use my name because there's no avoiding it. Everyone knows my name. Right. <laughs> They're going to find out his whether they want to or not. Right, exactly. You know how people are. <laughs> so so this thing just, do you think it was a tracker? Like, what do you think these, what's the objective for these devices being implanted into humans? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because the speculation on this is running rampant and it's fear-based and speculative. And I try so hard not to do that, you know, because this field is a mess. Mm. I'm very fact-based, very objective in my research. I don't edit people's accounts. You know, if you had a scary account, I will portray it the way you experienced it, because this is your experience. Right. I don't get a whole lot of that. 
but I have had people who've asked flat out, you know, what's this implant? What are you doing? Oh, we're implanting you. Why? What's it for? Are you tracking me? No, we don't need that to track you. We can find you wherever is what they right, basically right. Uh, which is true. And we know this because I did talk to a lady who did have an implant removed by Dr. Lear and the ETs came right back. Uh, but from what I've been able to tell from the contactees themselves who talk to the ETs, large, largely these are health-based, health-oriented. Uh, one lady was told flat out, this is to measure the levels of pollution in your body. Oh, wow. Another was told, this is to boost your immune system. Another was told, this is to monitor your vitals so we know if you're okay. Another was told, uh, a guy in England, um, this is to stabilize your um, whole health system. Uh, it's by and large health related. I talked to one lady, interviewed her personally. She sneezed out her implant. Ah. Uh, and she's looking at it, it's like, what the heck is this little cylinder thing? Yeah. And flicked it off on the carpet and then suddenly realized, oh my gosh, what have I done? Right. Never could find it. Oh, no. But got real sick after that. She, she got very sick with some sort of blood sugar problem. The doctors yeah. couldn't diagnose it. It wasn't diabetes. It wasn't hypoglycemia. So maybe that was keeping her well. That, I think so, because yeah, I mean, it could be. she started fainting on a daily basis. Her blood sugar was up and down, and uh, she had to carry around a peanut butter sandwich and a glass of juice, because if she didn't, she'd faint, and she'd take it, and she'd, you know, it was a problem. She lost a bunch of weight, and the doctors were really concerned. They were giving her a cocktail of vitamins. One day, you know, she's going to the kitchen to get her, you know, juice, and didn't make it to the kitchen. She ended up, doesn't know how it happened. She's on a table and uh, this tall, tall humanoid, she said it was 10 feet tall or nine, wearing sort of this black jumpsuit type uh, affair, walked up to her, said, it's your turn, Jill. That's not her real name, I'm using a pseudonym. And she's freaking out because this guy doesn't look normal. And he placed these silver bell-like instruments on her body, which pulsed energy on her pancreas, on various parts of her torso. So it didn't hurt, but it wasn't exactly <laughs> pleasant because she could feel it was very energetic. And she passed out and she woke up standing in her kit, in her, uh, where she had been taken in her living room on the way to the kitchen, rushed to her husband, could not wake him up. She has three children, couldn't wake up any of them. Finally went back to her husband, it took her 20 minutes to wake him up. Uh, and finally, he was very supportive. She's like, this happened to me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, uh, yeah, he was very supportive. But the next day, she was very sore on her whole body for a week. And by the end of the day, she's like, oh, my gosh, I didn't faint once. I didn't pass out. I didn't get dizzy. Wow. And she didn't the next day or the next. And the, the sore body healed up very quickly and she started she, her weight stabilized she was fine uh, she's pretty well, they sure cured her. yep that's one wow. of the healing cases that i yeah yeah personally I'm like you know, do you have any military in your family no what does your husband do you know what do you do? she's i'm a housewife in nebraska my husband's a mechanic I'm like okay so, uh, i'm trying to figure out who's being healed and why i eventually did figure it out to a certain extent but man, oh man, she absolutely feels for certain that they healed her. So who do you think they're healing and why? Yeah, I started digging deep into this because I was curious. You know, certainly we, almost everyone us on earth could use a healing at some point. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? And so I went through my files and I'm like, well, gosh, it's evenly divided. 50-50 between men and women. I've got cases of very young children, even a couple of cases prenatal people being healed wow. all the way to people who are, you know, elderly, you know, seventies or eighties. One lady was cured of jaundice, another guy of an enlarged prostate. Mm. And they were, you know, yeah, your were, book goes through all the different body parts and things. Yeah. So I'm like, gosh, what's going on here? Is it blood type? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. People of all ancestries and blood types. Is it geographical? No, nope. all over the world. So I'm like, gosh, what's going on here? Uh, 
I did find three main patterns. And one is that if you are a contactee, if you're being taken on board, if you're having regular contact, you're far more likely to be healed than say the average person who has no recall of any UFO experience. Over 50% of the healing cases fit that category. Another category I found was that people who are having contact in general are people who are profoundly psychic in some way. And this might be happening after their encounters or prior to, it's kind of a two-way street, but it's a pattern because people who are having encounters are often have mediumistic abilities right? or start doing astral projection or have precognition or can do healing or have physically levitated. I wrote a whole book on levitation. <laughs> so that's another pattern, uh, clairvoyance, remote viewing, all of that. But the pattern that I'm like, okay, I found it. <laughs> and this is, you know, I just interviewed this guy, Michael Carter, who worked against racism and discrimination. He was awarded by President Clinton for it. Uh, he had a healing of a blood clot in his leg. He's very well known in this community. He does lectures and has written books mm -hmm. and had this amazing encounter where he was healed uh, by a human looking ET in his bedroom in North Carolina. I'm like, well, gosh, this is interesting. But then this lady from Norway contacts me and uh, she's like, please don't use my name. I'm pretty well known. I'm like, okay, what happened to you? And she described how she uh, had injured her back severely and had to stop working because of it. She was a graphics artist, but ETs came and healed her of her back pain using this cylindrical device. I've heard it described by others. Grays came into her room, flipped her around like a rag doll. She yeah. said it was really scary. <laughs> She's like, who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> no answer. But then again, she is in full panic mode. So she's probably right. not fully listening because they will talk to you and tell you what they're doing. But she's freaking out. And they put this on her back. It pulses energy into her. And they walk through the wall. And she looks out the window. And of course, there's this bright, bright blue. And she rushes to the window and it winks out. She's like, what just happened? This is the weirdest thing. So of course, I ask her, have you had contact? So I'm expecting her to say yes. They almost always do. She's like, no, never. I saw one UFO once. I was with a crowd of people. It was way up there. It was not a personal. Thing. Right. So I'm like, okay, now this is odd. And I went through, you know, I had to describe the whole experience back and forth and went over and over it and no history of contact in her family. This was a one-off. So I was really stumped because this turns up. Finally, I'm like, well, what do you do, you know, for a job? It's like, well, I was a graphic artist, but I became very active in human rights and animal rights in my country. I'm very well known, I'm very active. Please don't use my name. <laughs> and that rang a bell for me because I immediately thought of Michael Carter. Hi. I thought of John Hunter Gray, who worked very hard to, you know, on Native American rights. And I started thinking, oh my gosh, Dolly Saffron, she's a nurse. <laughs> She's all about healing people and helping uh, and uh, people who are environmentalists. Another guy, he's an inventor from England. The ETs told him flat out, we're healing you because your work is really important. Another guy I interviewed in England, he's like a mathematics whiz into quantum physics. He's doing all this major cutting edge work. They, he was healed. So, so they're picking and choosing people like based on their life's work that's what it looks like yep it's not a hard and fast rule but it turns up again and again there's a lot of social workers a lot of environmentalists a lot of animal rights workers a lot of inventors teachers writers artists musicians uh pe just people who are generally good people one guy he was a lawyer but he was a good lawyer <laughs> uh so yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I mean, you, you don't hear of any healings among uh, criminals or mass murderers, right? It's like, so it seems to be a common theme that runs through all these healings. People have to be good people. Yeah. One lady, she asked them, you know, because uh, this was a couple I interviewed who live on Hawaii and were in Sedona on vacation. And weren't, they said, we weren't abducted. We were invited on board. It was wonderful. They were human looking. 
was a good experience. The craft was pretty much empty of anything, which is, you know, one of the details I look for because they're not filled with gizmos and control boards and right. you know, joysticks and panels. They're largely empty looking. So that was really surprising to them. I'm like, well, not surprising to me. I've heard this before. Uh, very much human looking. Uh, bald, large eyes, but otherwise. She's like, why don't you just come down and you know fix everything for people? And they said, we can't do that. <laughs> there are karmic laws we have to follow. You created your own problems. You have to solve them. Uh. Now, he was healed of carpal tunnel syndrome and a bad knee. He worked as a postal worker for many years. But he's a social worker now, or then, and she does herbal healing with a lot of testimonials in her community. And I think that's why that they were healed, because they're doing very good, important work. Yeah. They said, we, can, we help those who are helping others. That's what they told her. We help those who are helping others. I know that I've seen so many stories about how these ETs are so anti-nuke that they will, um, you know, present at nuclear power plants or facilities, rather, like government run and right. deactivate these nukes. I mean, we've all heard those stories, too. So obviously, they're humanitarian towards humans. They're not here for our destruction, right? Is that your take on oh, them? Absolutely. You know, and don't believe me. Certainly don't believe our governments, our lying governments, their history yeah, and terrible. truth is heinous. Do your research and look objectively, not through your belief system, because we all experience reality through a very thick lens of belief. And honestly, fear, because we're very fear-based in our thinking in our society. Take an objective look at right. the onboard experience, and you'll see what I'm saying is absolutely true. <laughs> They're not here to hurt, harm cause fear, take over, any of that. The first thing they will tell people is do not be afraid. Why are you so afraid? Have no fear. We're not here to hurt you. No harm will come to you. They reiterate it in every way they can. And sometimes people don't get it. They still have fear. And that's when they yeah. work. Yeah. Which is understandable. I get it. Absolutely. I mean, the only yeah. time I've really heard of any anybody getting hurt is if they touched a ship or went too close. But I guess that's but from... The radio. 100%. Right. Yeah, don't, don't run up to a landed UFO. <laughs> right. <laughs> because that can cause problems. Yeah. Who've had, you know, what we would call radiation sickness. Right. You know, sometimes the eye irritation, that's probably the most common in, quote injury. Uh, so, you know, physiological effects. There are some injury cases, absolutely, but they are far outnumbered by the healing cases, which are intentional. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and people are pulled on board and they're physically examined. And yeah, this can be really scary. Sure. Like be like, oh my God, it was evil. I'm like, what happened to you? They pulled me on board. I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. I don't think I asked for this. Often contactees will realize at some point that they did, in fact, ask or agree to this. But initially, no. Often they think this is something they did not ask for or want. Mm. It can cause a lot of fear. And this is when they will have missing time. And all they remember is this scary experience of being physically examined. But if you move, yeah, they me, start with that anal probe thing. They say, "Well, this." I think yeah. somebody even wrote a book on it: the UFO anal yeah. probing and it's nonsense. But I covered it in one of my YouTube videos because Did you? it had to be done. <laughs> I'll have to go watch that. <laughs> I had a little fun with it, but it's absolutely serious to people who you know yes. go through this, and it's not super common, honestly. I had trouble finding cases. Oh, so did I'm surprised. you? Yeah, I'm surprised at the tension and ridicule that that, how many times that comes up because yeah, it does. It comes not up. a big part of it. But yeah, people are physically examined and this is when they're healed. But if you can just relax for a second for Pete's sake and listen, they will talk to you. They will communicate to tell you exactly what they're doing. That's and then they'll and, and, Betty, and Benny Hill though. Didn't that turn out to be not not such a good experience for them? Or did the media portray it that way? The media portrayed it. Yeah. It was very scary for Barney more than Betty. Betty had a good time. They they explained all kinds of things to her. You know, this this is what we're doing. You know, at one point she experienced some pain. They immediately stopped it. 
right. and afterwards we're very sorry <laughs> they told her we're really sorry we, we did not intend for you to have any pain at all and here's where we came from and well, here's what you can understand here's a would you like an object actually we're going to give her a book and they did she was walking off the craft with it when they said they changed their minds like oh no kidding i didn't know that <laughs> yeah they said you can't have that she's like what do you mean you said i could have it this is my proof I'm like well that's the problem you know we can't give you proof this could cause problems uh this, hmm. this would not be to your benefit which uh you know, you can see why it might cause problems. <laughs> I wonder what kind of book it was. Did she get a chance to look at it beforehand or? Yeah. Yeah. What it, was it? A book about? It was a little blue book with vertical lines of symbols in it, which she did not know what meant. But it's funny that you asked that because I'm interviewing Dolly Safran, you know, with my book Symmetry. She's a fully conscious contactee. She's worked with the ETs. She knows why they're here. Uh, she basically confirmed what I'd already learned. But I, I was telling her about the Betty Hill case because I was doing research on people who've seen these books. And there's quite a few cases. She's seen them. And I'm like, yeah, Betty Hill had this. And she actually wrote down some of these symbols. Yeah, didn't she star map it out? Like, Yeah. She, I mean, she got a picture map, but she also wrote the symbols she saw. Mm. And Dolly's like, can you get a hold of those? I'd like to see them. <laughs> And so I found them and I showed them to her and she's like, oh my God, I know what these symbols are. I'm like, you're kidding. She's like, no, I can tell you exactly what each one of these, she got them accurate. And these were sort of flight manual instructions, which showed the craft, starting it up, going into a skiff position, turning on, turning off, turning, these sort of things. Uh, so they were showing her this. And this... Yeah, it's super interesting. I love the Betty and Barney Hill case. I yeah. heard they're doing a, a movie about it. I hope they do it well. You know, the Travis Walton movie, Fire in the Sky. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Well done. But the onboard seg segment, complete no trash. Absolute fiction. Yeah, because they made it horrific. So Yeah, and that's not what happened at all. And Travis Walton is a good example because he came away from his experience frightened, out of his skin. And finally thought it through and realized, oh my gosh, I think they actually saved my life. Because he was one of those dodos who ran right up to the UFO and zap. Yes, he did, right. Uh, so he thinks they saved his life. He thinks it was a positive experience. And most people I've interviewed come away like, I would never trade this for anything. They've healed me. They've woken me up psychically. I've gotten personal information. I've been told about the world. Got a whole new different viewpoint on the universe and our place in it. Uh, they're absolutely here for a few reasons. One is to announce their presence, plain mm -hmm. and simple. Mm -hmm. Let us know we're not alone. Another is to put us on the right path in terms of how we're destroying the environment, uh, nuclear power, uh, greed and corruption, war, aggression. The messages are always, always, always along those lines. They're going to talk to you. It's going to be about that. They'll give you a tour of the craft. They'll take you down to the engine room. They'll tell you how it works. They're like, why are you using fossil fuels? There's so many other sources of energy, what you would call free energy. It's available. They will give people detailed plans. There's a number of people who've worked real hard to, you know, they filed patents, the patent office. for well, some of these contacts. I've seen <laughs> some of them, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So I heard a few of them products. like uh, disappeared too. They kind of just, uh, yeah, and you know, <laughs> this subject is being suppressed and pushed back right. under the so called right. secret government. My right. point is, you know, ETs they'll take you up to the engine room, they will sit you in the pilot seat and say, Would you like to fly the craft? My goodness, I've got several cases of this. Why do, you, why do you think they haven't been more blatant and just come out and say, Here we are, and just do like a global appearance? Yeah. One guy Do you think it's that. against mm. their laws of interfe non-interference or no, no, I don't. Donald Shellcross, a guy from Virginia, I think it was, asked them that exact question because he had a face-to-face -face contact. He's like, why don't you just reveal yourselves? And they said, We have. And I I thought about that. I'm like, that's certainly interesting because it's true. If you look at the history of this subject, you will see every five or ten years there's a major wave where it's undeniable and makes the mainstream news. 
uh, where they show themselves over you know, of sightings, you mean? Yeah. Large scale area. Right. If you look at the schoolyard UFO sightings. Yeah, I read that. That was very good. They're showing themselves to over 100 schools, to closer to 200. Over drive in theaters, they'll put on displays. They put on what people, what right. researchers call displays. And are they going to do it to all the world at once? No, because that would cause chaos. And that's the last thing they want to do. They don't want to collapse people's religious beliefs. They don't want to cause, you know, economic chaos or, you know, right. political Which, but... unrest or anything like that. Right. They're doing it in a way that we can digest it. Why is our government hiding this from us then? Uh, because they don't have our best interests in mind. And you don't even need to look at the UFO subjects. You can look at any other area. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, of how our governments in general treat the people. Yeah, it's awful. Their motive is one of greed, of money, of power and control. And when it comes to this subject, it's, you know, on the double. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I used to underline. think that that it was about money, you know, in addition to power. But I, I they print their own money. So I think it's more of a control thing, you yep. know, than, than anything. And like, it just seems that way. But. Um, what about Project Blue Beam? Like, what's up with that? I, I see so much of that, di different videos and about the there's, creator there's a lot of, it. of buzz in the community right now about our governments pushing a, a fear-based agenda right. and going to stage a fake ET invasion. Or religious, right? Isn't it either <laughs> or? They're, they're going to use every tool in their basket. Yeah. You know, because we have people who are having horrific encounters that are actually my labs, are not ETs. Uh, they're being pulled on, well, quote, on board and seeing, quote, ETs, and they're not ETs and they're not on board. Uh, they are victims of mind control, which is very advanced. Our governments have technology and drugs and hypnosis and, you know, tools. I never made that connection. So you think the government's doing this intentionally to put this out there and, and make it make us think that it's legit. Yeah. Yeah. And I've interviewed some people who've been victims of this. Uh, I focus most of my research on cases of what I believe are legit ET contact, because that's what I find most interesting and most encouraging and you know most, I think, useful for all humanity. Uh, but I do think that our governments, and you can see this in certain UFO incidents, throughout history that are ramping up where they're portraying ETs as monsters, as invaders. So that's a part of Project Blue Beam then? Do you do you think they're going to do like some grand event, like some Black Swan event or something? Or what, what's your take? Yeah, yeah, I'm very concerned about it because yeah. they have, you know, we have 5G. Well, that's public. <laughs> the technology they have to create a holographic image in the sky we would not be able to tell whether this was real or not because they can, I mean, you can see this with billboards in Japan and stuff where whales are coming out and people. Oh, it's people crazy. Are... So what do they use? Satellite technology for this or like, how, how does that work? Or is it just holographic technology? I believe it's, you know, holographic in its essence, but you know, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, so I'm not really the, yeah, the it's guy to me speak wondering. on this, but... I follow it and I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder how they're going to pull it off. Like, so that's why I was thinking through satellites because it would have to be a global event, wouldn't it? I mean, they couldn't just pick a, a, a country and do it or over a certain area. I, I don't know. I would just think it would be. I suspect that they'll pick up, you know, a, a location, a country, a, a place and devastate yeah. it. They do have, you know, TR3Bs, reverse engineered. ET tech, saucers, strangular craft, they've got these things and they can physically appear over town and laser blast you to smithereens. Oh my God. And they will say, it's ETs doing it. And no, it's not. It's not ETs. We are the ones who commit mass genocide. Yeah, we absolutely. Are the ones who yeah, only human other. beings. I wonder yeah. if the ETs would intervene at that point and, and step in and say, enough is enough. Like, I don't know what the, I wonder what their threshold is for watching us, you know, Commit genocide and yeah, I don't destroy think our own globe. 
No, they've, they've intervened to the level that they can. And that's it, you think? Um, just based on the facts, yeah. Because while we, when we finally got atomics, right, 1940s, this is when people started seeing UFOs in large numbers. This is when people started being taken on board and being told, right. what right. are you doing? Uh, and yeah, they've shut down a few missile sites here and there, but right. they didn't destroy them. They didn't take away. No, they just deactivated them, right? Didn't they temporarily. just? Temporarily. Yeah. yeah. So no, the, don't count on them to stop a nuclear war. It's our lesson. You know, when someone dies, it's so devastating for us. To them, they understand that this is walking through a doorway. Life mm -hmm. after death is a real thing. You know, nobody actually dies. It's not the end as everyone kind of looks at it. So for them, you know, it's not the end of the world <laughs> as we would think of it. If every, you know, if the planet should go through a horrific existential crisis, that's our own doing. That's not their they responsibility. They don't see it as it's like the end of us. They don't, because there is no death to them, really, right? Right. And for that matter, they've collected all the genetics of animals and plants and people. And if it comes to a point where, you know, at, you know, the entire population would be exterminated. Yes, I think some people will be lifted off because this is a message contactees have gotten. A good number of them have gotten this message, been told directly or dream of the sky filling with craft. And it's their job to make sure that people aren't freaking out and to bring people on board. So, yeah, I mean, there's some element of that, that if it comes down to this planet being burned to a crisp by a micronova, or a CME, a coronal mass ejection, or a pole flip, or something along these lines. Yeah, I think they probably will intervene. But if we're going to have a nuclear war, no. Yeah, because that's on us, right? Right. Yeah. This has been absolutely fascinating conversation for me. Preston, I, 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 I hope we can do this again, because I still have a list of questions <laughs> that I never got to. Um, what are you working on now? Like anything exciting happening in your future? A new book, maybe? What's oh, what's happening with you right now? Of course, Caroline. I'm always working on another book. <laughs> I've got like five in, in the oven right now. I'm working on Symmetry Two, which is nice. a sequel to you know the story of Dolly Saffron and her amazing experiences. Because you know, I got a lot of answers from her case. Oh, hers, really? Hers is my favorite case. I'm gonna have to get that book from you because I have I, I have to read that now. Oh yeah, well I can send it to you. Oh, uh, I would love that. Thank you so much. I'm sure she, Dolly would be happy to do an interview with you too because. Oh, uh, I would love that. She's she's amazing. I mean, she can answer questions in a way that, that no other contactee. I mean, she has with, with absolute authority and experience. She's been there and done that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this so is you're working on the on staff on um, symmetry too. Yeah, I'm working on another book about my own out of body experiences because people need to know <laughs> there's no you don't need to fear death. You don't. It's a wonderful place we're going to. Don't rush off to it because <laughs> we can learn. Right, right. <laughs> but you, there, it's an absolutely wonderful thing to move to the other side. You will love it. It's like going to Hawaii. No oh. tax. It's free. You know, flowers. If you want to eat, you can eat there. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff. You don't need to. <laughs> Preston, I'm, be I'm being serious. Can Are you free like next week to do this again? Because I have got to talk to you about that. Oh, stop it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yes. Yeah, send me some dates. I will. I will. I mean, I know people things. are going to flip out over that and, and want to know too. Yeah. I, it's an important subject. Both of these. It's kind of. Now, what books? What are the names of the books that you wrote about that topic? Uh, I wrote, it's my only autobiographical book. It's called Out of Body Exploring, A Beginner's Approach. And it takes a person from, you know, the very beginning all the way to advanced stage. Because a lot of the books just dive in and make it sound so easy. And in essence, it is if you put forth the effort. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to be able to walk people through it. Absolutely. And of course, I'm going to have... Uh, screen covers of your books running across the screen and a link to where folks can, I'm sure they're available everywhere, right? Like Amazon and on your website and all the good places, right? 
Oh, yeah. Yep. Other online retailers, Amazon, my website, bookstores. And your website is, uh, what is it PrestonDennett.com? Um, essentially, it's PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. Oh, right, dot .Weebly. But, but that'll what work. What is that Weebly? I'm not, I haven't seen that in ages. Yeah, it's just a website service. Like Wix, is there hosting? Wix, like the hosting? Yeah. Okay, I got you. Well, of course, I'm going to have that running across the screen and also in the description of this video for people. So, folks, make sure you check the description below because I'll put all the links there um, where you can find Preston, his books, and all his information. Preston, thank you so much. This was one of my most fun conversations that I've had. I'm good. It was awesome. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be sending you an email for the next one because I'm super excited to talk to you about that topic. Yay. Hey, I love that topic. <laughs> thank you. I'll be in touch soon. All right. Okay. And if folks have questions, they can leave them in the comments. And next time we talk, maybe we could get to them, right? Oh, yeah. Sure. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Preston. <laughs> I will be in touch soon. All right. I look forward to it. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.